you're listening to only in Seattle. Well, Michael Patterson, and I always, I want to say Michael Patterson from Land Home Financial, and that is just not correct. No longer so, true. Yeah, Michael, mm-hmm. I've been, um, you've been a client of mine for years. You mm-hmm. are a mortgage banker, and you and I met through us ordering appraisals through your companies mm-hmm. and doing appraisals for you, and just, you've kind of been in my circle of people for, how, how long do you think we've known each other? Man, I think it goes back to the broker days, like American yeah. Mortgage Group over in Bellevue where I started. Yep. You know, so this is, these are my roots. This is where I started yeah. in Bellevue. And, when did you start uh, in the world? Well, originally 2001. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. So so we're was, coming up on probably 20 years right. ish. Right. I met you through Mike Mercer and Ken Smith, I mm-hmm. believe, at Lake something more. Lake, Lake Mont- Mont- Yeah, we Mortgage? had a DBA. Yeah. So yeah. Um, we were a broker for a period of time. I started yep. at a broker's office, learned yep. what I could, and about a year and a half, two years into it, started my own broker shop with a partner. And we had Lake Mont Mortgage, and then we became a net branch. For those of you that are familiar with that term, uh, we basically flew under our own name and branding, but we had a bigger company behind us that we kind of were under their corporate umbrella, if you will, and that gave us more capabilities. And they don't call it net branch anymore with compensation changes. Um, some of the terms are like enterprise branches nowadays. It's kind um, of a kind of a hybrid because business right. is changing so quickly, right. and people need different ways to be able to do business. Right. And, and a, lot so, of it, a lot of it had to do with compensation rules with TRID and some of the okay. regulations. And 2006, I, I dropped the DBA and just became a corporate retail branch with Land Home. So about 14 years with Land Home. And right. So long time. Long time. And yeah. you have recently made a move. Tell us where you're working now. Yeah. So I was offered a, uh, just a fantastic opportunity to take over a corporate retail branch up here in Bellevue. So, you know, you can play the audio the boys are back in town I, I keep hearing that in my head every time I come back in yeah town. thin Lizzie and yeah yeah so um so yeah just an incredible opportunity to take over really is kind of their flagship branch here in Bellevue um, okay all the operations are here in Bellevue for underwriting processing docs funding um, everything under that roof and I was able to step into a role where I'm managing 14 15 LOs that are already uh, producing. So for, those, for our, view, our listeners and viewers who don't know what an LO is. Thank you very much. We use yep. this vernacular. Yeah. You know, it's like, why do you say that? You know, we, we, we use this about, real estate jargon. Yeah. Talk. Loan originators. Yep. So licensed loan originators, yep. which there is a difference uh, for those of you that are not familiar with that term. But yep. all of them are, are uh, federally and, nas- and state licensed loan originators. And um, so we're, we're kind of the, we're primarily a mortgage bank, but we have that mortgage broker route. Uh, the roots in the company and so a lot of the same things that we were doing with land home we're doing at uh, american pacific mortgage here so you are michael mm-hmm. patterson from american pacific, pacific mortgage, mortgage. Yeah, that's the new gig officially the branch manager okay. up here yeah yeah mm-hmm. and you just made that announcement like this weekend just this I week yeah. yeah so last monday was my first day so okay yeah it was well, like congrats. drinking from a fire hose you know getting yeah. trained on different systems and getting up and running with the new yeah new systems yeah well, that's a big move. Um, it was. It wasn't an easy decision. Yeah. Um, and I don't have anything bad to say about my former employer. You know, they, right. They've Good done company. Great things for me over the years. And yeah. Um, you know, this was just a great opportunity to take on a much bigger role and use my talents and abilities. I think in yep. in the the ways that I wasn't able to use them before, and really grow a good team. And right. you know, we have. Um, you know, there's a lot of great stuff, you know, new technology tools. And we'll talk a little bit about that, I'm yeah. sure, you know, on, on, you know, being on the cutting edge of technology and making things streamlined for clients. Because that's really what people want is they want to be able to make it less of an arduous process to get a loan, you know. And then right. I think that's how we need to compete with some of the big box lenders. And, you know, we call them fintech, you know, the Internet lenders and so forth. So, yeah, being able to m- marry that, you know, technology, but yet also have that high touch, you know, have that advisor role. So how big is your current company? So as far as size goes, it's it's kind of interesting because they fly a little bit under the radar. So, yeah, because I don't um, know if I had heard of them previously. Yeah. But but there's so many companies out there like that, that right. until you kind of get into their systems, mm-hmm. you don't know there's so much business out there. It really is. Yeah. And and with yeah. the amount of there, I think there's 26,000 real estate brokers mm-hmm. alone. 
So I'll have people coming to me and, well, we've never heard of your company. I'm like, yeah, I've never heard of you. <laughs> the, you know, the, right. the market's so big. Right, right. Seattle market is so big now. Yeah. And there's so many na- nationwide companies in Seattle. And mm. your current company is one of them, correct? Yeah. So American, American Pacific Mortgage um, has been around for many, many years. Uh, they had, like I said, they started back as um, brokers and then coordinating multiple brokers together to kind of you know join together and get better pricing better service you know for clients and make things easier for the loan originators and as they've grown they went into the banking model where they were you know basically closing in our own name and maybe even retaining some of the servicing rights and so forth let's back up let's talk about that so people hear these terms thrown out Mm -hmm. mortgage broker mortgage banker as opposed to just a banker these are all right. people you would go to for a loan. Right. So, and if you guys, Nikki, Darian, and Tristan, if you guys hear terms that you don't understand, yell because that means some of our listeners and viewers probably don't know those terms as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. Michael and I have been doing this long enough where we use terms that we think are normal, but they're not. Mm-hmm. And then we need to have people say, "Well, we don't. We don't mean to make people feel dumb." But we just use these terms because it's part of our business for the last however. Yeah, know, and it long really time. is a foreign language. I call it mortgagees. Yep. So I always yep. tell my clients, "Hey, if I gloss over something and I throw out a right. term that doesn't Break make it down. sense, like you know, front end ratio, back end ratio, right? You know, even little terms like MI, people are kind of like, oh, they're like I, and I a lot should of times know people that. are afraid to ask, yeah, because they're like, okay, I don't want to sound dumb, right. right? But if you're a first time home buyer, you really need to know. If that you haven't bought a home, you're not going to know these. You terms. don't know what you don't know. No. So, so let's go through right. difference between mortgage broker, mm-hmm. mortgage banker, mm-hmm. and just a banker you'd meet going into your bank. Absolutely. So. Um, let's start with a retail bank, okay? Because yep. that's probably most retail bank would right. be like walking into Chase, Chase bank, bank of America, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, somewhere Home where there's Street. a retail banking center. Yeah, right? big bank. Yeah, commercial bank. Right, and yep. so um, the experience of that maybe walking into a, a bank branch and saying, "Hey, I'd like to," and maybe they have some advertising on on rates and so forth, and you want to talk to somebody. Some of them might have a loan originator there at the branch. Others might have a loan originator that's more of a um, application taker, yep. if you will. Um, so it really depends on the bank and who they have there on staff. But you can go to your bank there. Uh, I'll give you an example. So I, I interviewed a gentleman um, that came in, and on paper, he looked really great on his resume. He had about five years in the business. And um, I love this story because it kind of really paints that picture of the differences of the capabilities of some loan. And I, and I can't blanket this because sometimes you have really good originators on the banking side. It really depends on who you're working with, right? So he came in and I had just been in the heat of battle on fighting a file that was just kind of falling apart. And I went and argued with the underwriter about a condition and not argued so much, but just trying to figure out how can we make this work based upon what we've got and pointed out some guideline differences and she saw my way, right? And I had two of those files, one for myself, one for one of my loan originators that day that I had fixed. And so I was just fresh off the, the battlefield, right? And, Victorious and, though. Yeah my, yeah, and my secretary said, hey, you've got, an, you've got somebody waiting for an interview. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. So he comes in, I'm looking at his resume and uh, oh yeah, okay, great. So tell me a little bit about yourself and you know, you know, uh, personable guy. Um, and I said, okay, this is a great opportunity for me to kind of quiz you on these are the files I just dealt with today. So I gave him the, um, the scenario and it was, I was kind of saying, how would you fix this? And it was like, whoo, strike, not even close. Right. Mm. And I was like, Ooh, okay. You were asking him the question, how but to fix it. And how to fix it. Yeah. This is a scenario. This is and a challenge. What, what know. would you have done? And yeah. you know, it was kind of a guideline question and so forth. And, and. Um, it was tough, and I, I wouldn't expect too many people to get it, but it was like whew, not even close. Mm-hmm. And so the next question, I kind of lobbed him one, and it was like eh, maybe a foul tip, right? You know, it was, and right. so then I said, okay, well, this is how I fixed it. He He's hit like, it a oh. little bit. Yeah, so he kind of knew the vernacular, but he wasn't yeah. quite sure. And then uh, the second one, another file, I asked him a question, and it was like whiff. And I'm like, okay, we're three strikes, right? So tell me about how you operate your day. 
And he says, okay. And it was like he got his hand caught in the cookie jar. Right. Right. And his whole demeanor changed. He's kind of slumped over. And he he's was, like, the jig's up. He was a mortgage. Loan originator. Loan, loan originator. At a retail bank. At a retail bank. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So the and difference is he was interviewing he, for. He was trying to get a job with me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. As a loan. As a loan originator. Originator mm-hmm. at a mortgage. Broker. Broker. At the time. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, um, and I don't recall if he had his license. Most of the retail banks, they are registered originators. So they maybe do a little bit of a background check, but they don't have to take all the education. They don't have to take the exams that we do on the licensed loan originator side. So there's a okay. little bit of a difference there, just regulatory and, and experience. And um, so his whole demeanor had kind of changed and, and he knew the jig was up kind of thing. And I said, so walk me through your day. He says, I sit in a branch and people come in and if I'm on the phone longer than, uh, you know, 10 minutes, my branch manager is kind of giving me the stink eye. You know, I need to get off the phone because mm-hmm. I got people waiting. If I have somebody at my desk, 15, maybe 20 minutes, and then I'm, I'm getting this mm-hmm. tapping my watch time kind to, of thing. Hey, you need to, you need yeah, to move along it's time because we've got people. And so all of his business was coming to him. Whereas our business was really self-generating. We were yeah. generating referral Go out business. and get it. And so yep. I said, well, a couple things here. Number one, it doesn't sound like you really know how to structure loans. You kind of have the basics. And he goes, yeah. So I would take the loan application. I pull the credit, maybe run some pricing, give them kind of a, a general idea. If they had their documentation, great. If not, then I would say, okay, these are things that you need. And then I would refer them over to the mortgage department. And I would hardly ever talk to them again. Mm. And I said, well, you weren't really a, a loan officer. Yeah. You were kind of an order taker. Right. right. And he's like, yeah. So I'm really looking for somebody that can yeah. mentor me and train me and mold me, shape me into that, that person. So his job and his yeah. experience at the bank was basically somebody walks into the bank because it's a big bank mm-hmm. and he gets in front of them or they get in front of him and they say, I need a loan. And right. he gets their information within 15 minutes mm-hmm. and then it gets sent to somebody else within that branch and right. or banking system usually call center, call center. Or, yeah, yeah somebody else yeah and they'll they'll circle it. back to the client and get things rolling right. but he was not responsible basically for much beyond just information taking Right. And he would do like home equity lines of credit, maybe at the branch, you know, like something simple, you know, they would have their documentation sent and they could come in and sign it. And those are fairly streamlined. Um, those are really lost leaders for the banks. Right. You know, they're just, yep. it's the same reason why the supermarket puts the uh, milk and the bread at the far end of the, of the store. Cause you have to walk by the chips. You got to walk by the beer. Through. You got to walk by the 300% yeah. markup and get some gum. And yeah. So the stuff that makes money, it's the hook to bring them in. Yeah. yeah. But that was really how he operated. Not every retail bank might be like that. They might have a good originator there that takes it start to finish. But right. majority of them are just, you know, people that are going to take the loan application and send it off somewhere else. Right. Yeah. So how would that guy's job differ working for you as a loan originator at a mortgage broker and or mortgage banker? Right. What does that, what's the difference right. there look like? Well, and, and that was the key thing is I just said, you know, I really need to release you to a different opportunity. You need to, one, you're just, you're not generating your own business. And so we were purchase money specialists. We weren't doing a ton of refi business, but either way we were making our own phones ring and I didn't have a bunch of leads that I was buying to bring right. to him. And we weren't a retail branch where people were just walking in to do banking and, oh yeah, what are the rates today? So it was really coming to him, and I just didn't feel like in a 100% commission environment at the time, he was going to be able to work with that skill set to be able right. to generate that type of business. Yeah. And so I said, this is probably not a good fit for you at the time. Whereas on a broker level, um, when I first started, we were 100% commission. We didn't have any W-2 income whatsoever, which was, was great because you sunk or swim. You know, you, you started out and uh, Were you an independent in, contractor? Independent contractor, 1099. Yeah. yeah. yeah Just back in the day. Whatever you put yeah. together, that's what you make. Exactly. And I'd, I'd owned a cell phone business before. I'd been 100% uh, commission sales before. And, um, you know, my background was in originally in television broadcasting and, you know, production. And so I got a little disillusioned by the industry and decided to go into sales and then fell into the cell phone business sales. And, 
after that, a friend of mine invited me into the club, right? And that's kind of how we get started in the business. It's usually an invite or somebody that we know or a friend or right. family member. Very you, and you and I were talking yesterday. You don't go to college to get a four-year degree and then go, yep, I want to be a loan officer. I want to be a loan originator. Right. That just doesn't. That's a great base of knowledge if yeah. you have that. But it's not necessarily like a requirement. You didn't go to college to go, hey, I'm going to go get a four-year de- four degree so I can go get hired as an originator. It's and not a typical career path, is right. it? Yeah. Yeah. Now, you might get disillusioned after you got the degree and yeah. realize, like, I can't really make Doesn't any money. Everybody. Right? And then <laughs> yeah. decide, like, oh, what there's significant six-figure income available in, yeah. in originating loans and real estate. It seems so. like a lot of people, they go through the college experience and then they look around and go, well, I'm not really qualified for anything. So what can I make the most money at? Right. And there's so many guys that have gone down that road. Mm-hmm. Some of them still in the industry, most of them not. Mm-hmm. And that's just kind of how it goes because people don't really get into real estate after having gone to college as their career path. Right. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. There's very few co- uh, you know, college counselors that are yeah. deciding, right. hey, I want to go become a real estate agent and, yeah. you know, because then, I mean, it's one thing if you wanted to have a high-level career in mortgage banking, right? right. And But it's a different education than typically you're going to get at the four-year college. You know, you're going to have to have some additional type of training. But Yeah, and so um, much of the training that we require is on-the-job training and just right. years of experience. Yeah. So you were talking about, um, oh, hey, we're going to back up. So... You are the incoming president of the Washington Association of Mortgage Professionals. That's correct. Yeah. And Summit Properties Northwest was recently um, honored with getting an award. Mm-hmm. And we weren't at the award ceremony because I was doing something else. You had a better offer I was, from what I understand. Yeah. yeah, I was turning a year older. And so I reward myself every year to go to Hawaii and celebrate that, you know, one more year around the right. sun. Right. So here, the, our listeners can't hear us or see us, but... Michael is going to hand me the WAMP Award. I get to present, yeah. yeah. So just a little bit of a background. So the Washington Association of Mortgage Professionals, we represent every licensed loan originator in the state. Okay. okay. We also represent real estate professionals, consumers, and we're basically the state industry trade association. Okay. There's multiple yep. associations in the state, you know, Seattle King County Association of Realtors, WCR, um, we also have mortgage, uh, the WMBA, Mortgage Bankers Association, and we work a lot with all these different associations. But WAMP was traditionally, it used to be WAMB. It was Washington Association Mortgage Brokers. After the meltdown happened, we kind of retooled everything, and we really wanted to encompass professionals. The meltdown in 08? Yeah, because we're old enough. We got there was a lot of brokers that jumped out of the business, and a lot of them went to the retail banks or they went to mortgage, you know, banking operations. And so traditionally that that broker model. Now we've actually encompassed all the professionals, which kind of put us under a bigger umbrella, if you will. And we do lobbying on behalf of um, the mortgage industry and the consumers and. We're really working this year with other associations to become one voice instead of a lot of little associations talking to our our congressmen about different bills. And uh, we were really on the forefront of the Hearst decision, getting some bills passed to kind of help some of that. That's kind of another topic uh, regarding wells, you know, um, and water rights and so forth. We're looking at licensed loan uh, loan, loan originators. And if you do business outside of a licensed location, DFI is looking at that. Um, and a lot of it's kind of the equivalent of getting a speeding ticket when you got you know, or getting a seatbelt ticket when you get pulled over for speeding. If you're originating outside of that, meaning quoting mm-hmm. rates or pulling credit in a home office, that's kind of hands off. Not supposed to be doing that. So we're really trying to be on the cutting edge of this and, and get laws that get passed to help the consumer, because that's really what it's all about. Can we make okay. it? And so, and you, and you're the president, you're the incoming president, I'm the incoming president. I'm also the education chair. So I I oversee all the clock hour education because loan originators that are licensed are required to take um, a number of hours before they get their test and they have to pass their test. And then we have nine hours every year, eight federally, Mm -hmm. one in the state of Washington that we have to take clock hours, continuing ed, continuing ed every year to renew our license. You okay. know, in addition to credit reports and background checks and fingerprints and the whole works, right? All that good so, stuff. Because let's face it, when we do a loan 
for people. We know everything. You've got all their financial. I know more than their parents do. Yeah, you've got their right? social, you've got their credit. More report. than their stockbroker. Yeah. I mean, we've got everything. You've got the whole picture. Yeah. So a lot of information. We're being entrusted with a lot of financial information. Yeah. So um, I think it's important for the consumer to know that we have those type of background checks, you know, as licensed loan originators. So right. Yeah. So tell me, tell us a little bit about the award that the we won. Award, yeah. So every year we do a, a gala event. It's just a big black tie event, and you know maybe next year we'll have you there as a presenter, as a as a former award That'd winner. That'd be cool. That'd be I'd awesome. love to do that. But yeah. Yeah. I get to. It, it was. Uh, I was able to MC with uh, Tom MacArthur. He's one of my instructors, and he's actually president elect, so he'll be following quickly behind me. Okay. And uh, so the award is for the Business and Humanitarian Awards, where we recognize people that have just gone above and beyond um, what was normally, you know, standing apart, right, in the industry. And Outstanding Real Estate Company of the Year for Summit Properties Northwest, and you were nominated for that. Yeah. And I had nothing to do with it, okay. even though we're good friends, right? Well, who nominated us then, or um, how does that happen? That is, that's anonymous okay. for the nominations. All right. But so people are, are nominated, and then all the votes are basically put out there. Right. So yeah. people vote. So people yep. voted. And a lot of it could be maybe what you're doing in the community. Maybe you're the use of technology and what you're We've doing. We've got a pretty big social media poll and we put there it out go. there. There yeah. you yeah. go. Yeah. So, so people hey, think you're pretty great. Right. So <laughs> yeah. um, and, yeah. you know, so it's not just a good old boys club or you know, okay. the board members are voting for other people. And, you know, you haven't really been involved with WAMP, you know, over the right. years too much. I have spoken, um, I think, at one, I had one of my videos viewed by the down south it was a meeting down in tacoma okay probably and puget sound mortgage lenders maybe deanna powell was down there deanna yeah yeah i sat at her table mm -hmm. um and talked about some appraisal issues but nothing on the summit side so yeah. that was a neat experience to to win that award yeah it's a big deal yeah so that's pretty cool i'm very honored to be able to present it to you today so you know Excellent. we weren't able to do it in person yeah. but um, we're doing it now. We're doing it now. And that's why I was it's excited to get you on the podcast. Thing. So, you know, live on radio. Yeah. Here. So, Better late so than Sean, I just, as the, the president of WAMP, okay, I just want to uh, let you know that I'm humbled and honored to be able to award you this. This is a big feather in your cap and to your team. And it really speaks a, a lot of volume to the presence that you're putting out there in the community. And I know that you're making an impact. Excellent. So, well, thank you so much, Michael. You bet. Yeah, really appreciate that. And you know the guys that I introduced here, and all the uh, I think there's a hundred something summit brokers. Everybody kind of has their part, and then we've got another I think six or seven people on the uh, Reynolds and Klein side. Mm -hmm. Everybody's involved because we're we're independent. We are not part of any big corporate structure, so we're kind of right. out there cowboying it, doing it on our own. So to get an award like that is pretty cool, and because most of our work kind of just goes unrecognized. Mm -hmm. Except I guess people are seeing it because we got an award. People are paying attention. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so and much, that, Michael. I appreciate that. Is that is really, um, yeah. that's my core roots, man, is is that independent guerrilla marketing. You know, yeah. you don't spend a dollar on marketing unless you know what the ROI is right. going to be. Because we don't have it to spend. We don't. We don't have yeah. a massive corporate budget. It, it's almost an unfair fight today you right. know, because we're fighting against the fintech companies. Realtors are having the same issue. You know, sure. You guys are experiencing that. And yeah. And um, we don't have a billion dollars in ad spend. No. Right? To make the yeah. phones ring. We might have a few hundred. Right. So um, <laughs> yeah. it, our business is built differently, you know, so. Right. Hey, we're talking about um, you doing some video work. You're, you've got the green light possibly at your new place to do a little bit of video work. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I've, I've had the, the broadcasting background. Yeah, the background. Um, but... Uh, did a little bit of video stuff and it, it's like marketing always precedes volume by 30 60 90 days right so the marketing that you do today that's always going to help fill your pipeline as, as a salesperson, right yep and so you get busy doing marketing and then all of a sudden it works and it pays off and you start getting busy doing loans and so i really hit um, in my former position um, i found that i didn't have enough time to be able to dedicate towards some of the things that I really wanted to do video wise and because I was always in the trenches of pushing loans through and so forth. Working so. in your business, not on it. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So, but video is definitely king when it comes to um, marketing and 
Uh, I heard a statistic the other day. They were talking about Facebook weeding out a lot of the videos and the algorithm so you don't see everything in the in even people that you interact with all the time they don't want to see everything that you post so live video like facebook live those are actually going up higher in the rankings and they're being seen more um the, the second one would be like a video that's actually hosted on facebook so people don't have yep. to leave the party yep and then kind of pushed down is the youtube ones because they don't want you leaving the facebook platform right yep. And so looking at video in general, it just, it really makes, um, makes you connect. And I think the biggest thing is that client experience. That's the one thing that I always come back to. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I had a client over in Spokane and it was a first time home buyer couple. And I'm talking with the, the, uh, the gal and it was a referral from a realtor, which is 99% of my business comes from realtor partners referring business to me. And as I was going through the application and telling her what we needed, I'll send her the email link so she can do it online. A lot of people want want to do it that way. Uh, We have a phone app now that makes it super, super easy using technology because this is where people live. Right. On on their their smartphone. They're looking for their houses. They're getting loans. Yep. All right there. All right there. Yeah. In their hand. And so we're trying to make that easier for them. So had the conversation with them um, and I sent her an uh, email with a, a video embedded and she called me back like two minutes later after watching it and she says thank you so much for for sending me that i had this mental picture of you sitting over in seattle in a high rise office you know as a banker why should i give you a loan right right yeah and she had so much fear and anxiety she says you don't know how many times i went to dial your number but i was afraid because i just didn't know she had this mental picture of what you should what she thought you looked like you send her a video and she's like, oh, I can You're just a real guy. that guy. I wasn't wearing a baseball yeah. hat that day, but, right. you know, I wasn't also in Somewhere a three Somewhere in between suit. Yeah. Saturday casual. It was business casual. And business yeah, that casual. Day. Yeah. And she's just like, you're just a regular guy. And, and so it, it made that real. So, I mean, let's face it. Today, I would love to get face to face with every one of my clients. But that's not reality right. because people are busy and people yeah. really want the ease of being able to get an answer. A lot of clients would rather text me than call me. Yep. You know, so and I totally respect that. But we have to change as an industry to be able to accommodate that. And video is really a great way to put the face with the name if we can't meet in person. And some of the other stuff that we talk about is just that local celebrity, the people that know you, that trust yep. you and share your be information. The mayor of your town. Yeah. Mayor, yeah. Mayor, mayor Goldie Wilson. That's, you know, yeah. that's got a nice ring to it. Right. Yeah. And just having that local presence. <clears throat> right. And, you know, being real. And, and just getting your name out there. It yeah. really does make a difference. So I find it makes yeah. a difference on my end. I've, we've got so many videos out there and a lot of them are walkthrough videos on homes that we've listed and sold, but a lot of them are just me talking about topics. And when we have new brokers come to interview, you know, if I'm outside uh, coming into the office, maybe at the same same time they are, I can't tell you how many times I've had, oh, hey, Sean. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, I know I've got an appointment, but I don't know who this person is. They They know know who I am. And it's a little weird. But then I'm like, oh, hey, you must be whomever. Um, Right. Because they already know who I am, or they feel like they do, right? Because they've heard me talk in videos, and so it makes it it takes away that step, like you just talked about with your client, where they don't feel comfortable with you. They at least know how you sound. They kind of know what you look like, Mm -hmm. Um, and that really helps, and that goes a long way towards easing any discomfort they might have reaching out to you. Well, I think we all want to do business with people that we like. And we know and trust, of course. And and we live in a review society, too. Right. So how many five stars does this person have? And it's no longer I can cut and paste all my good testimonials. This is like, oh, no, this is real. This person actually going to have to take review. Right. Yeah. And so having video and having that personality come out. And I I would rather talk the whole hour about my my wife and my four kids. Right. I would. In fact, can I? Can I give you a little shout out right now? Yeah, so I've been for married it. for 18 years. I yep. got, got married the year I got into the mortgage business. Okay. Okay. So sold my book of business on the cell phone side. So just get married and go, hey, honey, I'm going to completely change careers now. Right. Right. I need hey, another you know that project. Career I was doing up until now that yeah. you thought you were marrying. What? Right. Yeah. Well, you know, that security. And road. it's like, hey, let's just throw a branch in the works. 
And, but she was, you know, totally supportive. And, you know, that first year was great because I was doing very well in the mortgage business, you know, back in the, back in my day, we were, we were selling 6.375 and we liked it. Right. You know, and everybody has those, those, you know, especially us that have been in the business for a while. Um, and we waited a few years to have kids and we now have three boys, 13, 10 and six that are just amazing love. If I would have known being a daddy was so cool, I would have started earlier. And you're super active. So I see yeah. your social media feed and you've always yep. got cool stuff going yeah, on. Yeah, I just, I love sharing kids. that. And then yeah. we were blessed with a baby girl. And that right. was a little bit of a surprise. Had a, yeah. had a, had the fourth. Yep. In the, it, last a little bit year. later, yeah. So she's two now. Two? Yeah. No way. Yeah. Because so. you and I went to a Mariners game with your wife and with my girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And that seems like not that long ago. Right. And she was pregnant. Yes. She was towards the end of her pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And you guys were talking about having the fourth kid. And so, so you've got four. We have four. Yeah. yeah. It only, it only sounds weird when I say it. Right. You know, right. cause it's just our world. Right. You know, it's right. I it's joke around. Do. It's like, Hey, this is my circus. You know, these are yeah. my monkeys. Right. Getting the boys out the door to get them to school in the morning. You know, right. we all, we've all had those challenges if we have kids, but yeah. Uh, and they're all different. Right. They all have yep. different personalities. All but, human beings. Are. Um, the thing I really love about the mortgage business is it's really allowed me to have the schedule that I want so that I can be at the high school basketball game in right. the afternoon. I can yep. be at um, my son's Christmas party or Christmas program. Right. And be there. Um, Basically but yet talking, I can schedule myself and talking about work life balance. It really and is. How do you make it's that important. work? Yeah. And that was another thing you and I talked about yesterday was you live down south. Correct. And yeah. you're now, your office now is in Bellevue, which mm-hmm. is a tricky commute. Yes. But one of your job considerations is that you can telecommute and you can come in yep. XYZ days a week. Mm-hmm. Um, 20 bucks in the jar for the phone ringing, right? Yes. Um, and that was my phone. Uh-oh. So, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. We can't Oops. say too much. This is a boss Sorry man. about that. I think Darren used my phone to take some yeah. photos, and maybe the volume got kicked yeah. up. Yeah, but so. that, that's important. That was a big yeah, part of— Yeah, work-life balance. That was a big question in my mind. Do I take that position in Bellevue because it is such a commute? I mean, yeah. we have transportation issues in our state. Yeah, and massive. Massive, yeah. And so, you, where are you in Puyallup? Are you in Tacoma? We're in Edgewood area. Edgewood, yeah. Okay, yeah. which is so next to Puyallup. It used to be called North Hill Puyallup. So it's yeah. on the edge of Milton, right, um, right on the bo- the border of, of King County and Pierce County. Pierce County. Right. No so. traffic. How long would that take you to get to downtown Bellevue? You know, without traffic, it's yeah. like maybe 45 minutes. It's, I mean, yeah. we can breeze, but... With bad traffic. traffic, bad Friday afternoon or Thursday afternoon traffic. What does that commute look if like? If I go at the wrong time, it could yeah. take two hours. Yeah, yeah, two yeah. hours. So, yeah, uh, on average, it's a little bit over an hour. I take the the good to go lane and try to car carpool when I can. But and that um, that's L A traffic. It really is, and this actually is systemic of the housing issue that we have. So, you know, a lot of us, we say, oh, we have a transportation problem. Well, name one, it's I-5, 405, 167, you know, even I-90 is getting backed up now. But the, the, the root of the issue is people have to drive to qualify. They can't buy a home in Bellevue. They can't buy a home in Seattle. So they have to drive to be able to find something that they can afford and have quality right. of life. And so I was in, um, Senator Fortunato's office down in Olympia, and we were talking about the transportation bill, and that's going to connect I-5 into 167. And so that's going to help the port. It's going to help commerce, traffic a little bit. And he said, so do you think we have a transportation problem? That's what we're there to talk about, transportation issues. And he says, we don't have a transportation problem. We have a Growth Management Act problem. We have a problem with density on can we build in the areas that people want to move, you know, we have to rethink how people live. We've got on the east side, how many empty bedrooms that people are not living in those bedrooms because people, you know, you have empty nesters and right. they don't want to sell yet. Investors and vacant homes. They don't want to change the the yep. neighborhoods, um, you know, the feel. Um, we were at a, a recent um, affordable housing summit down in Seattle and the deputy mayor of, of Bellevue was there and she was talking about this, that a lot of people don't want to change their 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 culture or their their feel in their neighborhood neighborhood right so whatever that means right to them i don't want to change my neighborhood 
But then finally when one sells, that house gets torn down and they put up a 5,000 square foot house and now the neighborhood has changed. Right. right. The feel has changed. Yeah. So how do we... And there's that growth pattern going on everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. And it's not a it's not a one answer kind of a thing, one solution. It's it's a mul- multitude. Like how do we create more first-time home buyer opportunities? How do we right. create more down payment assistance programs? Right. When we've got... Um, you know, for lack of a better term, a lot of it's monopolized. We only have a few programs here in the state where other right. states have multiple op- opportunities for down payment assistance and community second mortgages and so forth. So, um, and I think so much of this is is because of our tech environment. We've we've changed pretty dramatically over the last twenty years. Mm-hmm. Wild changes, and so all the people that need to, all the people that commute. I mean, we are selling homes in Olympia on the summit side and people are commuting into downtown Seattle and that is not Blows uncommon. Blows my mind. Blows Ol- my mind. Yeah. Olympia yeah. to Seattle. Or we've got people commuting in from Bellingham to mm-hmm. Redmond. Right. Bellingham to Bellevue. Mm-hmm. Not uncommon. Those are some big commutes. See, I used to freak out when I, people tell me, oh, I live in Clee Elm and I'm commuting over, you know, yeah. over to Bellevue. That actually seems like a, a breeze of a drive compared to with I ninety being open the way it is. Mm-hmm. That's not a bad commute. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's but, a lot shorter. But what does that say about the affordability? Right. So everybody says, yeah. oh, "Are we going to have another bubble?" And I think the only thing that we and I would certainly ask your opinion in real estate is, we're running up to the affordability bubble. Right. People can no longer afford. Right. The average person can no longer afford. And that's one of my questions for you is, do you think the Seattle market will have a slowdown like a lot of people are predicting? Mm -hmm. And and I'll give you my answer because you just kind of lobbed that out there. But I think further out, yep, we could have some slowdown. But close in, you've got too many jobs coming into this area. Yeah. Facebook is literally nine blocks down the road from our office here. Mm -hmm bringing in 5,000 employees, right? you know, they each have a family, that's 10,000, that's maybe 20,000 people. Where are those folks gonna go? That's the challenge, yeah. So yeah. all the jobs, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, you start naming all the tech firms, yeah. and all of the, all the feeder companies right. that also are contractors. And then all the financial companies. companies like yours, like American Pacific Mortgage, mm-hmm. in downtown Bellevue, in Redmond, Microsoft in Redmond. Right. And then South Lake Union just basically dominated by Amazon. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, these are monster, monster yeah. companies. And Amazon in downtown Bellevue. Mm-hmm. I mean. And the, and the challenge, that, as Deputy Mayor was talking about, was um, they don't want it in their backyard. We don't want high-density housing in our backyard. Right. We don't want to change the field. No. And the Growth Management Act, uh, King County bought massive amounts of acres from Weyerhaeuser and they have not been able to build on that those areas so when they've restricted that so right. I think a lot of it we have the mountains and the water so we really don't have a lot of dirt no so we need to use it more effectively. We're geographically bound right so yeah. you know, we just kind of need to rethink the way that we yeah. live and operate and light rail as light rail comes through we should probably have higher density housing around the light rail station so that people right. can say, hey, I want more quality of life with time. I'm okay living in yeah. a smaller unit and being able to just jump on the train, right? Which is what I think you're seeing happen all over Seattle. Mm-hmm. But because the east side and further out suburban communities mm-hmm. aren't really on board with higher density like that, we just keep complaining about traffic. Right, which is why Pierce County is one of the, the fastest growing markets. Right. Yeah, so, we did a video, Tacoma, yeah. hottest market in the United States. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I the aroma of Tacoma. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, and Tacoma is so huge. Yeah. It's a vast area. Massive. So when you say Tacoma, area. does it mean 38th? Does it mean North Tacoma? Does right. Does it mean Brownsville? North Point, Tacoma, Tacoma versus yeah. Hilltop. Yeah. I mean, you've got totally some different. wildly divergent neighborhoods there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So what are wrong. you seeing happen? Um, are, do you think we're up for a slowdown? We've got the affordability issue. Mm -hmm. You get people loans all day. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing happen? Well, I think rates have a lot to do with it. And even though I'm not a refi operation, I do mostly purchases, we're still impacted by the rates being low. And if the rates do start inching up a little bit, that does impact a little bit of the affordability. 
Some of it's just mental, though, you know. So if I quote a rate in the threes, it sounds really great. You can brag over the, the back fence to your neighbor and, oh, yeah, I got, got this great rate. Rates in the fours, a quarter point difference on the interest rate doesn't really impact the monthly payment that much. It's right. the amount that you're financing. Yep. That really is what impacts it. But for me, there was a reason why I said part of the flexibility of being to op- able to operate in the south end and on the east side is because I see the growth that's happening in Pierce County. And I don't want to walk away from that. And so There's we're so going to continue an operation there. in the south yeah. end. And that area has grown like crazy. So we're yeah. actually sprouting up some branches down in that area, too. Okay. We just have a new one, um, new branch manager in Maple Valley. And we're looking at Tacoma. We're looking at a lot of different areas down there. Federal Way is a really good hotbed. It's kind of in right. the middle, South King it's County. It's on the end of King County, mm-hmm. not quite into Pierce County. Right. Right. And then Tacoma has just gone gangbusters. Exactly. Yeah. They're so just. There's yeah. a, a lot of great opportunities. And, and I think Seattle is kind of the first. My experience has been we, we've been the, kind of the first ones, last ones to get hit by any kind of recession. And yep. kind of the first ones to come out. Yep. And so we've been kind of inoculated from some of the other stuff that's happened elsewhere in the country. Yeah. Because For of sure. the jobs, because of the demand. Yeah. We were insulated. We were heavily Other insulated. markets were getting hammered in 06. We were still going up mm-hmm. in in 07. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. we tanked as well, but not as bad. And we've since right. come back. Over and above. And then some. Right. Yeah. So there's a that's a just kind of a sidebar, too, is, is a lot of people are sitting on massive amounts of equity. And so if they're not going to move from where they're at because they're like, well, where am I going to buy? Where am I going to go? Yeah. So yeah. maybe start thinking about investment real estate because the rental market has heated up because people yeah. can't afford to buy. Right. So a lot of my clients were taking some of the equity from their primary residence and putting it into an investment. Um, uh, I, ta- I had a conversation about a reverse mortgage scenario uh, this last week with George Charles, one of our former WAMP presidents, right? And reverse mortgage specialist, he and his wife. And they're talking about reverse mortgages are not just for you know mary that can't pay her bills right these are for people also that are thinking about i'd like to keep my retirement money intact and instead of just living off of the equity of my of my retirement uh funds when i retire i want to put in a reverse mortgage and live without a mortgage payment or even pull money off of the line of credit that grows and so i'm getting into the weeds a little bit but using that as a financial tool. Using the equity in your home mm-hmm. to basically finance your retirement instead of, instead of just right. having it sit there. Yeah. Because so many people, and especially in the Pacific Northwest, have so much equity mm-hmm. built up So in you can home. buy a fourplex with a reverse mortgage, which is an interesting strategy. So if you're, you're, you're people that are retiring and they want to downsize. Is there an age requirement to get a reverse mortgage? There is an age requirement. Yeah. And How old is it? Yeah. So... Um, I don't propose to be an expert on the yeah. reverse mortgages, but the numbers really start penciling when you start getting into like the 70s and, okay. and you start seeing. Can you get uh, one because in it's 60s? all based upon actuary tables? Yeah. Right? So you can get right. them. You can get them at a lower age. Yeah. But the actuary tables, it's all based upon longevity. It says you're going to live. How longer. long are you going to live? Are yeah. you going to outlive the mortgage kind of thing? And right. so the actuary tables, based upon your age, based upon the equity in the home, that really gives you the the details on how big of a reverse mortgage loan you can get. But a lot of people don't know you can buy a home using a reverse mortgage. Interesting. So you could sell your existing home, take some of the money, put it into an investment. Right. Some of the money, put it as a down payment and use the reverse mortgage based upon the actuary tables and the calculator and what you can get on that mortgage. Yep. And then live if you need to mortgage free, but you could buy a duplex, triplex, fourplex with that. And then also live off the retirement income from the rental income. Right. right? And if you were a really bad landlord and you didn't have it filled, you don't have a mortgage payment to worry about because it's a reverse mortgage. Super interesting concept. Yeah. So maybe we can talk a little bit more in detail about that strategy some other time. Yeah. So if people have questions, they need to reach out to Michael Patterson of American Pacific Mortgage. Shameless plug, right? Yeah, shameless (laughs) plug. But that's why you're here. That's why we're having you on. Yeah. Um, Let's shift gears just a little bit. what is the most difficult loan you've had fall apart? I was thinking about that. You asked me that. And yeah. um, you and, know, and how did you overcome it? That's always the, hey, you had something go sideways right. on you. What did you do to make it come back around? Well, a couple of them come to mind. One of them, I had a couple that was 
separating, unfortunately. And yep. marriage um, dissolution. Yeah. And they had fifty properties between the two of them. Fifty five zero? Five zero. Wow. And some of them they had acquired before they got married, some of them they acquired after. They had had a pretty amiable separation, uh, wanted to make things good for the kids, you know. Uh, but it was almost 50 50 as far okay. as the properties. And that one, um, from just a time perspective, they had a lot of moving parts. And looking at this one's negative cash flow, this one's positive cash flow, and coming up with that rental income to qualify. And um, that one, although it was time consuming, wasn't overly difficult but it was something that was just, it, it took a little while. The other one that really came to mind was um, a client that uh, he had sizable assets that he would allow me to verify. He had other monies that he's like, you don't need any more than that. Okay, great. Um, had he was a, kind of telling he, you he's what He's a sophisticated you guy, right? He yeah. knew Fannie Mae, he could yeah. have four properties in his own name without yeah. it, jumping into different guidelines. Right. And I was refinancing three of his investment properties and lowering his interest rate on all three. So the challenge with him is he had multiple different companies. So he had, you know, he didn't fit into your regular, regular box. He had this LLC and this corporation. It really took a village, you know, so to speak, to do the income analysis on it. So I got to a certain point and said, you know, okay, what about this? He had some interesting um, net operating loss carryovers on the tax returns from some farm income that uh, was some causing some problems. Very tricky. Yeah, yeah. From lending perspective. So, um, so on one hand, we we did those three loans for him, um, and that was just all hands on deck. And we had really good underwriting staff that really helped out, you know, to do that. So my point on those is, if you just fit within a box and you can fill out an online application and it'll spit out an approval because you're W two and you know, you make a certain income and you have like you would score. do with an online lender. Right. Yeah. yeah. So if you fit within that, then that's great. But if you don't, if you're self-employed right. or you have a lot of moving parts, yep. it, it takes a little bit more of an advisor role to really put those together and structure those. Right. Um, we had actually talked to his, his accountant and wait for another business return to get filed so we can get a K1 because it was, it was a paper loss on one of his K-1s that was throwing everything off. And so we had to kind of delay that. And that was our Wait solution. for another cycle of taxes and returns right. to go through. Yeah. So now that same client, um, he had another loan on a, it was a hard money loan on an investment property that he had been holding on to. And he wanted to cash that off, pull some equity out and take advantage of another opportunity. And so we're looking at that going, oh goodness, here we go again, right? You remember it took us quite a bit of time to do that. So I actually opted for, um, and this is one of those mortgagees, non-QM loan. Okay, so a non-QM loan is a qualified mortgage, non-qualified mortgage. So uh, the TRID and the Frank Dodd Act basically put in some requirements. So every loan is really full doc, right? We, you know, we have to have tax returns, W two pay stubs, all the paperwork. We have to be able to to document that the borrower has the ability to repay because a lot of the problems that we ran into before were stated income where you had somebody, that, oh, well, how much do I need to make to qualify? Well, you need to make this. Well, I make that. OK, great. And then put it down and put it down. And congratulations, yeah. you just bought a house that you had no business buying, right? right? The good old days. The good old days, right? Yeah. And we didn't do a whole lot of that, but that was prevalent at the time. And, and so that was basically a stated loan. Yeah. You state your income, this, you get the loan. So with the requirements now, even even some of these non-QM loans, you still have to document that the borrower has the ability to pay. Okay, so we have a program where you don't have to get tax returns. So we didn't have to go down that road. We just looked at will the property cash flow based upon 90% of the market rents on the property. And then he had to show at least six months payments of reserves for the property, subject property as well. So it was really an asset reserve loan and almost like a commercial loan because we're looking at will it debt, debt service itself. And so instead of having this huge, huge underwriting, um, you know, all these different documents and taking all the time, it was much more streamlined because we just get the appraisal get a market rent analysis on the appraisal operating schedule and will it cash flow based upon the interest rate and it's an adjustable rate mortgage had a three-year prepayment penalty on it you know so it was something that he knew was going to be in place for a period of time but that was a much easier way to go than have to wait 
for all of this other stuff for underwriting mm, and jump okay. through all these hoops. Different angle for a different borrower. Same not, borrower, different scenario. Not everybody fits in right. the same box. Yeah. And the same borrower can have wildly different criteria for a different loan. Right. And so, it was all about the goal and, and what he wanted to accomplish. So, right. And we were talking so. a little bit about why you might not want to use an online lender. And you mm -hmm. were kind of breaking that out for me. Maybe you can walk the listeners through and the viewers through. Yeah. Well, and that's the that's really what we were talking about before is that what is the experience right. with the client? Yeah. And I actually was testing it out when Zillow started putting more retail mortgages online and so forth. And I went on and applied for a loan just to get some rate quotes. And immediately my phone was blowing up. Yep. Right. And I must have, I got, you I must have got like 15 different calls and I just, yeah. I finally just set my phone down and watched it ring and let everybody go to voicemail. And, um, so, and that was great because I got my answer quickly, but when I did answer and talk to them, my answers were wildly different between, you know, cause I threw out some scenarios to them. And then a couple of weeks later, all of a sudden I was back on the hot sheet and boom, boom, boom. My phone was kind of lit up and everything. And what I've noticed from looking at competing lenders, you know, for my clients to say, well, I got this quote over here. I said, OK, well, send it over to me. A lot of them are located out of state. And so they're not familiar with our local customs on fees and charges. And they're listing things that are not applicable and maybe some things that they left off. Right. Uh, one of my clients got an estimate that over the phone, they were talking about having mortgage insurance, but the estimate that they sent over doesn't have it. And so he's looking at the bottom line thinking, oh, well, that's a good payment. And I said, well, there's no MI. What do they say your home is worth? Because you need probably 40 more thousand to get under 80 LTV, LTV, loan to value, yeah. right? So under 80% loan to value to avoid mortgage insurance. He said, well, over the phone, he said, I'd be paying about $93. And I said, well, it's not on your estimate. He's like, yeah, I was wondering about that. So, you know, some of the experience of getting information fast, you know, how much time does that person really have to research and run the numbers and run the title and fee, you know, the title and escrow fee calculator and run the mortgage insurance calculator and calculate how many months of prepaid in, or, or um, taxes and insurance have to be included. So do you want just a quick and easy answer? Or do you want the correct answer? Yeah, an answer that actually help you right. get a loan. And, and so yeah. speed is not always going to give you accuracy. Right. Right. Um, on the broker side, the benefit of being a broker is that you have a multitude of different lenders and you can shop it from wholesale lender A to wholesale lender B to the wholesale lender th C to see A, which one's going to fit the guidelines best. And this is what you do. That was is it. As a broker, you know, yep. you have that wholesale right. channel. Um, you have the ability to do that on I top of I have the ability to do that banker, now, right? Direct. As a mortgage banker, we've <clears throat> basically worked to the point where we have um, economy of scale because we have so many loans that are coming through. And so we have different correspondent lines with different lenders and investors, or we may sell direct to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. We have these capabilities. And so we can drive down some of that cost and we have the economy of scale to give uh, highly competitive interest rates and the control because we're not having to wait for a third party to underwrite it. We're not having to be at the right. mercy of a wholesale lender and their turn times. If we have a file that needs to leapfrog, we have that ability to push things through. In fact, one of our uh, top producing loan originators brought in a new loan last week and it was a, a builder loan where the client was buying new construction and the builder's lender couldn't do the deal. But they had their earnest money on the line and they really mm. had to close. They're in the hot seat. All of a sudden it blew up yeah. and they don't want to lose the house. And the builder's like, I got somebody else, you know, I can sell this to. And so that scenario was, that was crunch time for that client. And so he brought it in, structured it, brought it into underwriting. We actually got that thing approved, ordered a new appraisal, got that done um, really quickly on a rush. And those are things that are not going to happen with an online lender. Right. Because they yeah. don't have that capability. They don't have that kind of control. Yeah. So we are we actually just got that approved, docked out on Friday. We're going to close that within seven days. Super quick. It's a, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. amazing, right, for a, a, an operation of this right. size to be able to be that nimble, right? So if you need a quick a quick uh, loan closing, mm -hmm. Michael Patterson. <laughs> yeah, we don't Pacific want to do that on, on a daily basis, but um, most people can't even pack their boxes in seven days, right? No. Yeah. 
That's but, one thing with real estate is that it's not meant to be a 24 hour process because people right. need a little bit longer to contemplate. And it used to be 30 days was super fast. Right. Now we're down to like maybe 10 on cleaner files. If you have to put a big full court press on them, mm -hmm. maybe it's two weeks, 10 days. I don't know. A couple of weeks is a couple yeah, weeks. If you yeah. have, and you know, again, if you know what you want, a lot of the decisions really come back to working with an advisor and that's a, are you going to get that from a 10 minute conversation at a bank? Are you going to get right. that from a 10 minute conversation with this call is being recorded for quality assurance? No, it's being recorded because John is the licensed loan originator quoting you the rate, right? right? Okay, we're done here. Gotta Let get me the get right you back over to phone. Sarah <laughs> and she'll take care of you. And yeah. you never talk to the guy again. And he's dealing with because he was just the initial day, phone call guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that internet based call center lender. So does he care if your loan closes? Yeah, but he might not care as, as much, much. Right. right? Whereas right. my business is all in referral. Yeah. And if I blow up a deal, that could be a, a challenge with my referral partners. Right. right? If I and it's a portion of your income that. Yeah. that you should have had that didn't get put together for whatever reason. Right. Yeah. So there was a um, and just a real, another scenario here. So. I got a referral from a realtor. He'd been working with some clients. The client was up in uh, Oak Harbor and his wife um, was going to school down in Maple Valley. So every time they wanted to see a home, he would drive down from Oak Harbor mm -hmm. to go look at the home. Long drive. They did this for eight months. What is that, an hour, hour drive? Yeah, it was. he was driving two hours between wow. okay. you know, going back and forth, back and forth. at least yeah. two hours at, yeah. every time. And um, so she just, she wanted to be in that area. So newly married, right? And they've been working with an internet call center lender, okay? And if I told you the name, you, everybody would know. Right. And he was military, right? Yep. So, and they have a tendency to specialize in military loans, VA, VA loans. loans. So he f kind of felt, okay, they, yep. they should know. So they applied eight months of putting an offer, not getting accepted, putting an offer, not getting accepted. It was a really hot market in the area they couldn't find in their price range as soon as one pop up it's just like scooped up so they finally get under contract and they go back to the lender and they say okay well great send us over all your documentation they hadn't looked at anything they didn't look at the w-2s they didn't mm -hmm. look at the pay stubs you they, know, hadn't they just said this is how much file. we make okay great yeah. we ran the numbers yeah you can afford that credit looks great you know they did look at credit um so as it turns out the wife had been working part-time and she had just recently changed jobs. So sent it over and they said, oh, they called him back. Oh, your wife's working part time. She hasn't been on the job for two years. We can't use her income. So mm. I'm sorry, you can't you can't Ouch. buy this house. Right. Eight months. Mm. And they finally find the house and get it under contract. Brutal. Right? So had they so, taken a little bit of time, they would have been able to ex and looked at the file. They would have been able to explore, right. explain to the borrower. This is a challenge. This is, a, right? this is going to be hard. Yeah, don't change yeah. jobs before you, right. you know, switch gears. The other part, the other thing that happened was um, he was military and he was exiting the military within a year. And we can't use the income if they're going to get out of the military within the next 12 months mm. after, you know, the, the first mortgage payment on the loan. So, um, and it's as interesting. So a number of challenges. number of challenges that yeah. could have been avoided had we gotten more involved, you know. And right. so... Um, I actually stepped in to fix it, but then found out he was exiting the military. Right. And so the good thing is I developed that relationship that came back to me after she graduated from school. And then we were able to use her career income right out of college okay. and use that income to qualify. And so about six months later, they ended up buying a house. They were able to get a place. Yeah. Yep. So, But it was yep. a little bit of guidance to get there. So Right. And they were yeah. probably really disappointed when they realized we're not going to be able to get our dream home right. that we've been looking at so hard. It was so tough. Yeah. yeah. And that's why you go with somebody that is experienced and that you've got from referral mm -hmm. that they can get the loan closed or right. if they're a real estate broker that they can get the deal done for you. Right. Yep. And it really is about that experience with the client. So are they getting accurate information that they can count on? We do a full underwriting approval many times. So they're fully approved in underwriting. So yep. we can call the listing agent and say, when do you want to close? All we need is clear title, satisfactory appraisal, and let's go to docs. So that's almost as good as a cash deal. Right. And the sellers don't have to take a cash offer and lower their price. Right. They don't so, have to discount it. 
Yeah. yeah. So just take it. having the capability as a as a mortgage bank operation to right. do that. So yep. and it's really all because of our team. We've got an amazing staff, an amazing uh, um, underwriters, processors, loan assistants, and they're all in your Bellevue office, all which Bellevue. is mm-hmm. a really big deal yep. for people outside of the lending industry because you don't have to wait to hear from somebody in the Midwest right. who might be done for their day with their business day or somebody on the East Coast to make an underwriting decision. You don't have mm-hmm. to wait till tomorrow. You can just walk down the hall and say, hey, I need a read on this yeah. and get information. And for a mortgage bank to be ranked in the top 11, 10 to 12, I think we're ranked 12th right now, depending upon okay. who you talk to, to be that nimble is amazing, which is one of the yeah. biggest things. And I'm looking forward yeah. to working with you. I'd like to get mm-hmm. uh, Reynolds and Klein on if you guys have a panel, an appraisal yep. panel or an AMC. Always, already yeah. in my thoughts. Yep. Okay, yeah, I'll Absolutely. hit you up on that. Yeah. Let's go through. We are at the, towards the end here. I want to go through a couple of fun questions. Mm-hmm. Michael, your favorite band from the 1980s. <laughs> I knew this was coming. 1980s. This, 80s and 90s. It's yeah. like there were so many good ones. So yeah. I always joke around. Like, Let's start the, with the 80s. In the 80s, um, so I was in high school. Okay, yeah, years so was I. Myself. What year so, did you graduate? 87. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, the exact same age. I was yeah. like big in the in the 80s metal band scene, yep. right? You know, and and I was hitting all kinds of concerts and so forth. And my little brother, I was joke around. He's about seven years younger than me. And he was watching Ghostbusters and wearing his Michael Jackson T-shirt, right? You know, As you did, if you're that right? age then. Yeah. And my <laughs> sister, she was like into the Duran Duran and the Depeche Modes and, yeah. you know, all of those. So, like, secretly, I like, okay, I like Adam Ant. He's cool. You know, mm-hmm. you know, okay, some of the Duran Duran stuff. And my girlfriend was into Bon Jovi. And oh, like, yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll go to the concert with you. So She might still be into Bon Jovi. She might still He'll be he's, he's a pretty handsome cat he right? is so he's kind yeah. of dreamy but um you know so that the 80s rock scene um i was kind of into that uh, yeah. metal band type stuff yeah but one of the very first ones that kind of introduced me to that was def leppard yep. and i just i really really pyromania loved. came out when you and i were in eighth grade yeah and that was a monster album right that yeah. was a big one um yeah High and dry, though that was the one before that, yeah. and That's so it was like that was classic, right? Yeah. So um, on that scene, I, I think the early days of Def Leppard were, were okay. some of my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. But as far as number of concerts that I went to, I saw Aerosmith three times. Okay. You know, always a great show. ACDC a couple times. Yeah. You know? So I was always driving over from Yakima, where I grew up, over to the okay. Tacoma Dome or Seattle. To come over to this side because yeah. that's where all the shows are. Now we've got was. the Gorge. We had Night Ranger in town. You know? Okay. But, I mean, you and know, Night Ranger is awesome. And Rail, right? Yeah. You know, so. Rail. You remember that? Oh, yeah. yeah. From here. Yeah. They were from either Bellevue or Redmond. Yeah. Saw Queensryche at, yeah. down Seattle Center. and. Yeah. So it trying to nail nail one down is really tough. Yeah. You know, but I would probably go with later in the 1980s, and that would be Guns N' Roses. Yep. 1987, Appetite for Destruction. Great studio band, not always so great in concert. Well, th- back then it was you didn't know what was going to happen. Right. Anything could happen. Yeah. Axl Rose walked Axel off stage. Do. Yeah. He was drunker than a, he was drunk as a sky. high. And yeah. he something, and he got hit with a shoe, and he got upset and left after the third song, right? And everybody was like bummed out, you know. So yeah, well in St. Louis they know. had a they had a riot, <laughs> and they tore the stadium apart. And Where was that? Guns, Guns, uh, St. Louis, I think it was. Oh my goodness! Guns and Roses got sued, um, and yeah. it was just a massive debacle. Yeah. But okay, how about the 1990s? Favorite band from the 1990s? You know, I think it was just a carryover. I think some of the longevity of like Aerosmith and you yeah. know some of how they kind of reinvented You wouldn't have a Seattle the grunge Beastie band Boys, in there? Right? You know, and, and how about became, a Seattle grunge band? Seattle grunge band, you know, um, Pearl Jam was yeah. just, yeah. I mean, just yeah. iconic. Right? I'd probably go so, with either Soundgarden or Nirvana. Yeah. Just. Either, yeah, all three yeah. of those. You know, yeah. Pearl Any Jam of those and Soundgarden, awesome. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I might even throw in a candle box as a ringer. Candle boxes. Yeah. yeah, they're pretty good. See, and that's the thing. It's like, how do you nail one down? Yeah, so. they're all pretty good, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. All right. How about Coke or Pepsi? I've always been a Coke yep. fan. Yeah, Is it I don't drink Coke a lot of pop Coke? or soda or whatever you call it. You know, but um, classic Coke, man. Classic yeah. Coke. And Go for you, the sugar. If you look around, Go for the caffeine. you can get the real sugar bottle. You know, like you used to have to have them imported. I think they have them now, right? It's like it's not 
fake sugar. It's not high fructose corn syrup. Yeah, it's actual it's the sugar, saccharin. the sugar, sugar in the Coke. Yeah. Those are the best. Yeah. Yep. Michael, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I enjoyed talking with you. My pleasure. Thank yeah. you. You've got a great operation and uh, congratulations again on your award. Yeah. Thank you for this presenting is, it in person. I yeah. know Nicole from the WAMP uh, presented it at the actual association mm-hmm. meeting. But to have it from you, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So, Michael, thanks so much. Thanks so much to all our listeners and viewers out there. Uh, This was Only in Seattle with Michael Patterson of American Pacific Mortgage. Thank you so much for tuning in. We will catch you on the next one. Bye. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you'll know when our next video is out.